So I will uh, stick to the title that was assigned to me, in fact. Um, uh, yeah, because I think uh, yeah, socioeconomic factors they play quite an important role uh, in adoption of intercropping uh, practice. This is, uh, yeah, there's lots of attention to other aspects, to agronomic aspects, soil science aspects, and so on. Um, but what might affect it, certainly to quite a large extent, uh, are the socio-economic factors. Are, and there are many things I could talk about, uh, but I want to focus on a few issues. Um, first, I want to continue this discussion, which Chair Jan also touched upon, upon diversification versus specialization. Then, especially from an uh, economist point of view, so what do economists have to say about that? After that, I will continue to discuss uh, the impact of off-farm work. Uh, so migration or when uh, some household members work outside of the farm, to what extent will that affect intercropping? That's an issue that will that's coming up uh, all over the world, I think, and especially, of course, in a country like China, where I'm doing lots of research. So, uh, yeah, I want to look especially on, on, at the theory. Uh, yeah, well, what the theory have to say there. Then uh, I want to present an analytical framework that we used in one of our recent studies that can be used for uh, yeah, obtaining more insights into what are the important driving factors, socioeconomic driving factors of the use of intercropping versus uh, yeah, monoculture in agriculture. And then I want to end with uh, Two case studies which have been published, which I wrote together with uh, uh, Wopke and, uh, uh, and a few PhD students in Wageningen, China Agriculture University. One is on uh, 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 with melon, uh, which is uh, uh, part of the intercropping system, which, uh, in the, yeah, which was added to the double cropping system of wheat and maize in the North China Plain. And then uh, I want to move to the, to the northwestern part of China, where, uh, where recently some uh, maize uh, uh, intercropping systems with other crops, relay systems, have been introduced and look at some economic aspects of that. So those four topics uh, I want to discuss with you. Um, so first is issue of specialization versus diversification. Uh, Thierry Jan already discussed this uh, yeah, in much more detail than I can do it. So briefly summarizing, monocultures uh, do have quite some negative effects on biodiversity, ecosystem services. Thierry Jan already discussed the issues also like the, uh, yeah, maintain, maintaining uh, poll poll pollinators, uh, for example. Um, environmental pollution caused by intensive use of inputs, uh, use of pesticides, overuse of fertilizers. Um, could also add compaction there, of course, like Thierry Jan did. Um, and the sensitivity to pests and diseases, of course. Uh, so overall, yeah, monocultures tend to have quite some negative ecological consequences. But what do economists say about that? Well, what I, yeah, why, like Thierry Jan already said, well, they may be more economically efficient. I even want to to bring it one step further even um, because the, the economic benefits of specialization on the one hand, if you focus on one activity, so for farmers, if you want to focus particularly on one crop, it means that you, over time you will tend to get more knowledge, more experience with it, so you learn more by doing. So that's one major advantage of just focusing on just one activity or one crop in the case of farmers. Um, another advantage is that cost can be much lower. Um, cost of transportation, if you need to transport your inputs to the farm, um, yeah, if you need different inputs for different crops, of course, then it, it might increase the, the cost. Um, also transportation from the farm, away from the farm. Um, yeah, when it's just, that's one of the advantages of monoculture as well, that the transportation cost will be lower uh, because fixed cost of transportation can be divided over a larger quantity of output. Um, and, and the same holds for all kinds of cost in production. But that's also one of the reasons why you see, especially small farmers joining cooperatives as a way to reduce these kind of costs. Um, 
Another advantage of focusing on monoculture as compared to uh, uh, diversification of crops is that um, yeah, when, uh, yeah, when, when certain activities need to be done at the same time, then a better division of labor is possible. You can assign one labor who's good at certain activity to that activity, and another laborer who's relatively good at another activity if it needs to be carried out at the same time to that other activity. Um, but what is also stressed a lot by economists is that once you start hiring laborers at a farm, it also requires quite some labor supervision cost. That uh, especially when they obtain a fixed wage, it means that they may not always uh, provide labor in the way that a farmer himself or herself would do it. So there will be some cost involved there. And the larger the number of laborers is employed on a farm, the larger this cost will be. So that's why in economics, there's lots of searching on, uh, for what is the optimal farm size, um, depending of course on what is also the wage level of these laborers, which are hired on, on the farms. Um, then another issue that also might need to be stressed is that uh, when you have a larger farm and especially focusing on just one crop or just a few crops, it generally means that you are better able to access credit, to obtain credits from the, especially from the formal system, from the, from the banking system or other institutions um, or from uh, agribusinesses and also the better able to obtain high quality inputs. Uh, so inputs which focus on a certain cash crop that you want to produce. So when you uh, focus on, when you grow a large share of your farm with a certain crop, then businesses might be more interested to sign contracts with you that you obtain high quality seeds. Uh, you get advice on what type of fertilizer to use. You may have better access to fertilizer, the pesticides and so on. So there are quite some advantages there as well. And that's all at the farm level. Uh, of course, at the regional level, if more farmers focus on the same crops, it also means that uh, within a region, it also becomes beneficial to start processing industries. Uh, especially when, when, when the cost of transportation are quite high, then it makes sense to have these processing industries quite close to the farms that are producing it. Or to start, uh, you know, to start to, to start companies that uh, arrange the tra transportation of your output, and so on. So, and there may also be investments in infrastructure to facilitate the the transportation, especially of the outputs away from a region. So all in all, um, yeah. So, so this this. In the process of economic growth, specialization plays quite an important role. Um, what, what you see uh, yeah, with growing incomes is that people start to specialize. Some farmers stay in farming, others become uh, bicycle repairmen, become butchers or whatever. Everyone specializes in what he or she is good at, obtains more knowledge, uh, gets lower cost, and then by trading uh, all parties gain from it, as long as the cost of trading are relatively low. And that's quite an important source of economic growth all over the world. That's what you see happening all over the globe. Um, it also brings me to what is a basic constraint to specialization, that is especially the functioning of markets. If you compare relatively low income countries which middle income, high income countries, you see that especially the way markets are functioning, the cost involved in the use of markets, they determine to quite a large extent to uh, yeah, where the specialization between farms and other sectors take place and also where the specialization within farms takes place. Um, it's good to realize for, for non-economists that economists, they use quite a broad definition of markets. Um, yeah, markets are defined in, in economics as a, any institution or mechanism which brings together buyers and sellers of particular goods and services. So it can be the, the, the open market where you go to, 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 to buy your bread or your vegetables and so on. It can be shops where you buy certain goods. It can also be the internet where you buy certain goods. 
but it can also be for for example just your neighbor or a family member um, where you uh, where, where you make arrangements on exchanging land or uh, getting credit for, uh, for for a certain period and so on so all those by economists are considered as markets So what if some of these markets are failing? So an economist, when we talk about failing markets, it normally implies that there are relatively high costs involved in the use of markets, and that's why they hardly rise. So these high costs may have to do with high cost of transportation from the market towards the, the farm in this case, or from the farm towards the, towards the market itself for the output. But also transaction costs are also part of that. So transaction costs are especially the cost, the, the, yeah, the time involved in searching for the best buyer or the best seller, uh, negotiating um, yeah, the, the conditions, the prices of selling or buying, um, yeah, monitoring whether indeed uh, yeah, the transaction takes place or not and under the conditions that were agreed and so on. All those are considered as transaction costs. And when they are high, of course, then markets will also tend to, to operate on only a very small scale or perhaps even be fully absent. So what if, for example, food markets are failing? What would, this, what would it mean for a farmer? And what would it mean for, uh, yeah, for, for specialization versus diversification? So in the case of failing food markets, of course, it means that as a farmer, you need to ensure that you can still consume all the food that is needed for your family. So it, it means that there will be uh, less of a drive towards specialization and more, uh, yes, more uh, need to diversify. Um, and what if a labor market fails? So if there is, if it is very costly or almost impossible to obtain laborers on your farm. Um, so it means that the available family labor needs to be spread over the year over different activities, which might also mean that it might make sense to, to grow different crops, which need to be planted at different times, need to be uh, needs weeding at different uh, seasons and harvesting at different seasons as compared to one crop where all these activities take place in very short periods. So again, that would mean that it leads to more diversification. And the third type of important market uh, is the insurance market, and not so much the formal insurance market. So where you go to a to, to insurance company and try to get an insurance for your crop for when your crop fails, or perhaps even for the prices that you get uh, for the, the, for for your output. But um, especially info markets are quite crucial here. So to what extent can you rely on your own network, on your family members, on your relatives and so on for insurance? So if one of your household members falls ill or if you have a bad harvest, to what extent can you rely on others that they would help you? That when your income is too low to, uh, to, to send children to school or to buy the food that you need, um, then we talk about informal insurance markets. Um, so in these markets fail, so both the formal and also these more informal markets for whatever reasons, then there, of course there's also a need for spreading risks over crops. So um, spread the risk of prices. So uh, yeah, when output prices, uh, for, uh, crop prices go up and down quite a lot, then of course you want you would be especially interested in planting crops where these uh, where these prices are expected to to, to have different patterns over time. Um, and the same of course for for crop failures. You might either uh, spread uh, risk by growing different crops or choose crops which have lower risk as well. That's also an option. Finally, the fourth market I want to discuss is the credit market. Again, there you may make a distinction between formal credit markets, so where you get uh, credit uh, from a banking, uh, from from the banking system or other credit institutes, and informal markets. So, whether as a farm you're able to obtain credit 
from from your neighbor or for friends or relatives uh, and so on, which also happens quite quite a lot, especially in lower income countries. Um, but when as a farmer you don't have much success to this kind of credit sources, it also means that you will have less access to high quality inputs. And that also means that, especially for growing cash crops and specializing more in uh, yeah, high value crops is, is much less likely. So in conclusion, this means that um, yeah, specialization from an economic point of view surely is quite crucial uh, for poverty reduction, income growth, economic growth. Yeah, specialization means that people can divide the tasks. Uh, yeah, so some people focus on farming, others focus on other activities and markets are being created through that where these goods are exchanged and both sides benefit from it. And the same holds also within farms as well. Specialization can also be quite an important instrument for quite an important way to get rid of poverty uh, for income growth uh, and economic growth in general. But, and of course that's quite crucial and that's coming back a lot in this winter school, I assume, is there are important trade-offs with ecological aspects. So specialization has uh, overall quite some negative ecological effects um, and normally farmers are not paid for these ecological services that they provide and that's one of, co of course one of the main problems. So if you want to read more about this there's a very interesting study a very good quality study by Stephen Klaas and others. I added a link here so if you click on that one then, uh, then, you, then you can read much more about these trade-offs between the economic uh, benefits of specialization and the ecological and, and, and its trade-offs with, with, with the ecological damage that it might cause. Um, my second topic uh, is on the, the main effects of off-farm work, of migration. So what can economists say about that? What does theory say about that? Well, of course, there's one quite clear effect that's that when people work outside of the farm, so when one or more household members migrate and the others remain on the farm, clearly it means that labor is lost. So in principle, it means that less labor is available. And intercropping, of course, uh, and not all types, but many intercropping types, they tend to be relatively labor intensive. One of my examples later, I will also show you an example where it tends to be much more labor intensive. And of course, when labor is lost, then you would expect that it has that it reduces the likelihood that intercropping uh, takes place. Um, but of course, it depends also a lot on the market for agricultural labor. If one or more household members work outside the farm, but it's relatively easy to hire laborers on the farm, and perhaps uh, they, they, their wages are lower than what can be earned by your own fam fam family members outside of the farm, then of course this effect will not show up. So again, markets play quite an important role there. Um, but it's not only labor, lost labor. Off-farm work migration, so the remittances that migrants will working in urban areas, for example, set home to, to their home uh, fam, fam, family. It also means that there is more money available, more uh, liquidity uh, available, which can be used for buying inputs, for example, that could not be bought otherwise. So buy better quality uh, seeds, for example, or buy fertilizer, um, or, or, or buy some types of food. So again, this is more likely also to, to lead to more monoculture, to make farmers focus more on cash crop, on the cultivation of cash crops. But again, also here, it depends a lot on how the credit markets is functioning. If it's relatively easy to get credit for the working capital that you need, that you need for buying inputs, for, for buying seeds, fertilizer, pesticides, of course, then this effect doesn't play a role. But if credit markets are not functioning well or are absent, as is often the case in relatively low income countries and also uh, yeah, the, the main, the, the, most of the regions are 
I've been working on in China, these credit markets hardly function at all, because then it may have quite a big effect. Finally, that is third effect of off-farm work I want to stress, which is distinguished in the literature, is that it also may have a risk redu reduction effect. So why is that the case? Why does it reduce risk? Because it means that there is one additional source of income, and it's a totally different source of income. It's earned elsewhere. So it's, it doesn't depend on the risk in agriculture, so the risk of a crop failure, the risk of uh, low crop prices and so on. Uh, so it's an additional source which is not correlated with the income source uh, from, uh, in agriculture. So that's also one way to reduce, of course, the income risk. And that may be, in fact, an important motivation for people to send one or more household members to work elsewhere, to not work on the farm. Um, but of course, it also means that there is less need for crop diversification and interpreting that as a farmer, you might focus on just one or a few crops um, because, because the need to do that from, from a point of view of risk spreading is much less because now there's another way of spreading risk. And again, this also depends, of course, on the insurance market. If especially this informal insurance works quite well when you have a very good network within your, uh, yeah, with family members, uh, with local people, of course, then this, uh, and then, then, then this impact on crop diversification and intercropping will be much less. So the conclusion of this, of uh, so what is the impact of all farm work, of migration? Uh, on the likelihood that farmers use intercropping, is that overall it will have a negative effect on the use of intercropping. Um, but this effect will be smaller or may even be zero when markets function well, when uh, agricultural labor markets are there and they function well, when the credit market and the insurance markets are there, when they function well, then off-farm work will hardly have any impact at all at intercropping. But in theory, you would expect it to have a negative impact. So let's look at what could be a useful analytical framework for analyzing. Uh, it, it only this framework then it only focuses on the socioeconomic effects. So of course, also uh, agroecological climatic conditions play a role as well um, in this choice of activities. So I, I distinguish the three main activities that we're looking at here. So one is whether to use monocropping or to use intercropping. And also, uh, yeah, whether to work more time off farm and less time, spend less time on the farm. So that is the in the, in the center of this framework. That's what we're focusing on. And of course, um, yeah, these choice of activities depend quite a lot the income level. Um, that is uh, obtained from farming and from earning an income outside of the farm and also the variation. The, uh, yeah, to, to, to what extent do incomes vary over time? Um, and normally, of course, there is a sort of a trade off. Farmers, uh, normally farmers, especially relatively poor people, are willing to uh, to have a slightly lower level of income if the variation uh, would also be much less. So if over time uh, it would go up and down much less. So there's also sort of a trade off there. But these activities on, on, on the one hand, of course, they determine these income levels and the variation, but also the income levels that are obtained from it, they also determine to quite a large extent which activities are chosen. But um, I think any framework, any study analyzing the impact uh, well, the reasons why households choose certain activities should also focus on what kind of assets, what kind of resources do households possess. So these are the natural assets, so the especially the, the amount of land that households have access to, that they own or that they can use. Um, it might also be the livestock on the farm. Uh, physical assets, the machinery, of course, uh, you know, when, when a household possesses tractors or uh, harvesting machines or sewing machines or whatever, that will also affect quite a lot of course, the choices that will be made uh, and the type of farming and whether or not uh, to go off farm or not. 
the finance, um, yeah, especially the the amount of savings that they have. So can they buy certain inputs from their own capital resources that they have or not? The human capital. Um, so how many laborers are there in a are there, are there for doing work? And uh, yeah, what kind of education do they have? Do they have training in agriculture or do they have other training? That's of course quite crucial. And finally, what economists uh, see as a third, as a fifth important type of asset is social capital, which is mainly the networks that they have. So they also, they, these networks are crucial, of course, especially for credit and for insurance. Um, so they, the, the you know, possession of these assets determines to quite a large extent uh, the choice of the activities which are in the center of this framework. Um, then there's other category that should be taken into account are the household characteristics. On the one hand, the demographics, or especially the number of children uh, that need to be fed by a household that plays an important role, especially when food markets do not function well. And also the risk preferences, whether uh, households or the persons taking the decisions, whether they're more risk averse or not, that clearly plays a role as well. And finally, I want to stress again these markets, markets like I showed on the previous slides for food, insurance, credit. Um, so uh, then we talk about the, uh, uh, about the accessibility of these uh, markets, in particular also what are the prices there and what are these costs of using the markets or the cost of transportation uh, and the transaction cost on these farmers. But that will come back in one of the two case studies I will discuss. I will briefly touch upon these two cases that we've been doing research on. Um, so the first case study I would like to discuss with you is this uh, um, wheat maize watermelon intercropping system in the North China Plain, um, where we did research in, a, in an area where the traditional system is double cropping of wheat and maize, which is seen a lot in the North China Plain. But we did research in a village where watermelon was introduced into that double cropping system as, a, uh, yeah, as an intercropping system. So it was planted already when the wheat was still in the, uh, in, in the field and the maize already had been sown when the watermelon was not yet harvested. Um, so we did a household survey in 2012 to examine both the economic performance and also the sustainability of this system. Um, and in this table that I show you on this slide, um, they, I, I put some of the main outcomes. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, let me go back. Uh, yeah. Do you still see the slide now? I see it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I clicked something on the wrong. Uh, uh, so my my screen disappeared, but now it's back. Um, so um, so this shows the labor use on the one hand in the wheat maize double cropping in terms of hours per hectare um, as compared to this intercropping system, which is on the right hand side of the And you see that the labor use was more than three times as high, three to four times as high. And of course, the main reason there is that this watermelon, which was introduced in the system, that almost all activities had to be done by hand and that took lots of labor. Um, but interesting to see is also that maize also took more labor because the maize planting could not be done by machine anymore. It had to be done by hand. So also that took more labor in the system. Yet the gross margin, so that's the income earned, or the, the revenues minus the cost of all the inputs that I used, uh, went up quite a bit, almost 50% higher or even slightly more, more than 50% a higher gross margin, so uh, it, it, the system was quite profitable. But of course, you should compare it with the labor use because this labor could also have been used in a different way. So that's done in the last row, and there you see that this income that's earned per hour in the wheat maize double system is quite a bit higher. There's more than two times as much in this double system as compared to the uh, to, to to this intercropping system, um, yeah, but uh, if you would compare that 
with the average local wage that could be earned in agriculture, it's only 0.78 US dollar per hour. And, and uh, outside of agriculture, there are higher wages could be earned, but around at that time in 2012, 1.58 US dollar per hour. So by having this intercropping system, still uh, farmers could use more than they could use outside of agriculture. So in other words, this intercropping system, at least at that time, was quite beneficial. It provided much more employment than this double cropping system. Um, because more than three times as much labor was required, um, which meant that farmers didn't have to work off farm during the lean season. During yeah, the, because this wheat maize double system doesn't require that much labor, so there are quite some lean seasons where farmers need to go off farm. So this was quite beneficial from an economic point of view. But of course, you need to take into account that watermelon as a cash crop, of course, the price might fluctuate a lot. And in 2012, the price was relatively favorable, so these advantages would be less when prices are lower. Um, but what we also show in the same study, I will not go into details there, but you can read it uh, when you click on this link to the study below. It also used almost twice as much irrigation water um, in, uh, as compared to the double cropping system because it's all uh, you know, flooded ir irrigation. So also when there is less wheat planted uh, on the land, still the amount of water applied to the land is the same. Um, and for similar reasons, also fertilizer overuse, uh, which is already there in the double cropping system. And it was even much higher in the intercropping system because it's much more difficult to apply it with uh, uh, sufficient uh, uh, precision. So there were quite some uh, yeah, ecological disadvantages of the system. So in this case, there are quite some economic advantages because it's not uh, yeah, comparing monoculture with uh, div yeah, diversification, my view, but it's just adding one more crop to the system, which is done uh, yeah, through this intercropping system. Uh, so, so there are quite some economic advantages, but also quite some ecological problems, which it is creating. Okay, then I want to end with this maize relay intercropping systems in northwest China, where we went to the Hoshi Corridor in Gansu province in, uh, in the northwest of China, where there's a wheat maize relay system. It's a traditional intercropping system in northwest China because yeah, the, the growing season is too short to have just one crop. But in recent years, because it took quite a lot of water and it is quite a water scarce area, novel systems were introduced where maize was combined with certain cash crops, uh, particular cumin and seed watermelon in the region we did our research. So we did a farm household survey in 2014 to examine the socioeconomic factors that affect the traditional uh, intercropping system and the novel intercropping systems. And we focused in particular also on the impact on farm size. So with policies trying to promote farmers to have larger farms, yeah, yeah, what would it mean, what you would expect? Larger farm size needs, needs, means more mechanization, so less interest probably in, um, uh, in intercropping. And there we applied this analytical framework that I presented uh, before. And the main findings there, you can see in this table, um, yeah, I summarized it here. So, the, so f uh, it's th these are the results of a regression analysis where we try to explain the area under intercropping um, in uh, yeah, of farmers. So the total intercropping area, which you see in the second column, then the traditional wheat maize area, uh, the cool, uh, maize intercropping area, and the watermelon maize intercropping area in the last column. And then in the in the, in the rows you see the different explanatory variables that we used for that. So one is the land that was allocated by the village to a household. So what you see there is that when more land was allocated, and slightly more than uh, so, yeah, larger farmers would also plant more crops under intercropping. So slightly more than 25% of the uh, yeah of the increase in area was used for intercropping. Um, but you see, it's not a traditional, that's not significant. So three stars means it's highly significant. 
but wheat maize area did not increase uh, uh, significantly. But the novel types, they increased in particular. That's what farmers are especially interested in when they have lots of. And the number of plots also had, so given a certain land area, then when farmers had more plots, they were also more likely to use intercropping, but not so much for this watermelon maize area. That was not significant. Machinery. That's quite interesting also uh, after listening to Jetjan Stomp's presentation. So th this is a dummy ver ver variable just showing when farmers possess machinery, do they use less intercropping or not? That's what you would expect. And what we found was a significant positive effect of machinery. And that's but the only area that was affected by it was in fact the cumin maize area. So we, that's of course quite an interesting result. What, what explained it? So we, we, ha, we went back to this region, had an interview with some local farmers trying to find out what was going on and they showed us this machine. Uh, so this is a, a wheat sowing machine and they said, well, the same machine we can also apply for cumin sowing as well. So we already have this machinery available um, and that's why, we, yeah, when we have these kind of machines, then we much more, then, then then we also like to use it for planting cumin uh, and, and and to combine it with maize in the field. Uh, and Che Jan was all, might also be happy to see that it has only two wheels instead of four. Um, labor land ratio. So what? So the laborers in a household per hectare. So there we there you would expect that the more laborers might mean or intercropping, well, we didn't get a significant effect there uh, for the total intercropping area, but for the watermelon area, there we found effect a negative effect. So, uh, and in fact, watermelon again is very labor intensive, but only a very short period. So the probable, uh, the, yeah, the explanation that we came up with is probably it means that uh, households with more people, more laborers, they sent they, some of them may work off farm and the money that they earn there, so the cash income from that is used for hiring laborers to, to work during the, uh, to, to, during the busy season on, uh, on their farms. So it's again a sort of an income effect, which, uh, which leads to, uh, to, to, in fact, to less uh, intercropping for this specific type. Finally, risk aversion, there we didn't find any significant effect. So where the farmers uh, are more risk averse or not, we didn't find any effect there at all for this really intercropping system. So in summary, we found that large farms, they do not plant more land with a traditional intercrop, but they do plant these two novel intercropping types that, uh, they, they, that we focus on. So this policy, ongoing policy of increasing land sizes, that doesn't mean that intercropping will disappear in this area. And what is interesting in particular is also that this availability of machinery doesn't have a negative effect on the intercropping area, but we even found a significant positive effect on one of these novel types. Um, so when the available machines can be used, for, uh, yeah, for, 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 for these novel intercropping types, then it can even have a positive effect. And finally, risk considerations, they do not play a role at all in this really intercropping in this area. So all in all, it means that the positive effects of intercropping, they can be realized if farm scale enlargement is combined with policies promoting these kind of novel intercropping types, that was the main outcome, the main policy recommendation we came up with in this study. So if you want to read more about this, these are the references, these are the studies where you can also find link in my presentations. And, uh